the first question is, there are, as of September 2021, there were 1,062,205 medical doctors in the United States, according to Google. So the question is, these doctors are basically the source of health information throughout the country. How much of the information that the medical doctor that we go to see is based on clinical trials? In other words, before we talk about clinical trials, I wanna understand when someone goes to the doctor and the doctor gives you advice, is, he, is clinical trials a little piece of how he advises you or is it a large piece? Because if it's only 5% of his opinion, then it wouldn't be such a big deal if clinical trials were accurate. But if you're saying, no, it's a very significant way that he makes decisions on what you should do, then we would be much more concerned about clinical trials. So the first part is how much do doctors base their information on clinical trials? Then the second part is, are clinical trials accurate? In other words, all of us in the public have been told our whole lives, don't worry, before anyone gives you any information, any doctor, they carefully look at clinical trials, which is this incredible system that guarantees that only the most accurate, precise, perfect information gets to you. You have nothing to worry about in terms of safety because a clinical trial has been done. So the general public feels like when we go to a doctor and he goes, they did a, I read a clinical trial in a medical journal. We feel like this has been triple checked by the smartest people in the world. So those are the questions. How much does the doctor base his opinion on clinical trials and are clinical trials a solid, accurate piece of information that we could count on and know it's accurate. If you could, Stephen, each, why, don't, each, why don't you let me? Uh, why don't you le let me lead off, and then everyone yeah. can attack me. Sure, you okay. can all speak on this. You can all, all, right. all comment. So, on it. the FDA and pharma work together to fake their drug patent studies. They use statistical manipulation. They corrupt their research subcontractors. They hide studies that don't promote their drug sales, just like they did with uh, the HPV vaccine. And I'm going to I'm going to give a couple of quotes uh, to to lead off this discussion. Peter Gercha, who's one of the founders of Cochrane, which is one of the remaining uh, accepted uh, uh, source of information in medicine, he said the pervasive scientific misconduct has led to a research literature where one has to dig deeply to find the few gems and all the garbage. And the title of a BMJ editorial last year was "Time to Assume That Health Research Is Fraudulent Until Proven Otherwise." So I, 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 am, I assume everything is fraudulent until proven otherwise now based on these uh, accurate sources. And I, I don't think that anyone bases their actions on good research that is carefully done anymore. I mean, it's just, it's been a mess for 20 years and it's gotten progressively worse to the point where it's a lot of it's total fraud. So there, so attack that. The medical journals are prostitutes. I mean, their editors are paid hundreds of thousands of years openly by drug companies, and 95% of their articles are ghostwritten by industry. And in law or business, these sorts of, quote, conflict of interest could result in criminal prosecution. But in, in medicine, you just have to disclose your conflict of interest. I mean, there are payoffs. I, I think uh, I could probably give a different uh, perspective on that. Um, clearly, there is some good research out there. One of the problems is that most doctors don't have the scientific skills to be able to distinguish between good trials and bad trials, and they're often not given all the information. However, a completely different angle on this is that in some areas of medicine, there just aren't any trials. So it's not like the trials are corrupted or badly reported. They just haven't been done. Um, and that's particularly the case in surgery. We recently published an article looking at surgery for chronic pain. Um, and we reviewed 12, uh, we looked through 12,000 clinical trials that had been done in these, the 15 most common procedures, most common operations. And so there's a lot of trials being done, but we found that less than 1% of those trials actually compared doing the surgery to not doing the surgery. So there's thousands of trials looking at tweaking this little part or, or you know, adding a screw here or uh, uh, you know, the, the technical aspects of a procedure, but there's very little evidence in surgery 
um, that doing it is better than not doing it. And what we found is when those studies were done in the handful that we found, most of them showed that doing the procedure was not more effective than not doing it. And yet these are procedures that are still commonly done. Um, I'll go next. Um, I remember the day I got my white coat in medical school, one of the uh, most uh, prestigious and prolific uh, uh, writers in the field was uh, uh, asked to you know, speak to the class. His name was Dr. Martin Gardy. And he at Cornell Medical College, and he said, and this is a common refrain, 50% of what we teach you is wrong. We just don't know which 50%. Now, that was an offhand comment and pretty much everyone else in the class forgot it. I remembered it and said, you know, I'm going to have to basically keep my eyes open for the rest of my career because if every, you know, 50% of things are wrong, you know, I've got to learn how to do it right. You know, the problem is that a lot of doctors, as you said, Ian, you know, don't have the skills. They go to medical, medical school because it's, quote, trade school. And, you know, they apply, they apply that trade for the rest of their careers and don't really learn how to do things properly or keep up uh, and abreast with uh, uh, new information that comes in. And I agree with that. I do agree with that. Having said that, um, there is data that actually shows that 10% of what we know in medicine today is due to randomized control trials, RCTs. Now, when you talk about clinical trials, there are many different kinds of clinical trials. There are clinical trials that are basically 1,000 case reports. That's a clinical trial. There's also clinical trials that are not randomized. There are some that are randomized. There are some that are double-blind, placebo-controlled randomized. It, you know, there's different levels of clinical trials. So saying the word clinical trials doesn't actually mean anything because you have to talk about which kinds. And it's only been shown that randomized controlled trials actually rise to the top in terms of uh, veracity. Having said that, there is another uh, level of proof that is, that does constitute proof that people basically throw in the garbage and should not, and I do not. Their studies, these are natural history trials. This is how we know, for instance, tobacco causes lung cancer. Has anyone ever done a clinical trial where they've taken naive patients and started them smoking? Ain't gonna happen. Illegal, immoral, get thrown in jail if you tried. So, but we still know that tobacco causes lung cancer. How about chronic traumatic encephalopathy from football trauma? We know that too, but there's been no clinical trial. So there is a level, it's called econometric analysis, which is a natural history time course analysis that where time and change over time, uh, uh, assessing the confounders as you go will also give you information that does constitute proof. These are the Bradford Hill criteria for causation. If you include econometric analysis, the uh, level of what we know in medicine rises from 10% to 50%. But that still means that 50% of what we know in medicine is basically pretty much random. So bottom line, I agree with the, the other members of the panel, we clearly don't have enough in the way of true veracity of evidence and we don't really understand what evidence-based medicine even means. Thank you. So I guess I'm up next. Yes. Um, and I wanna build on what Dr. Lustig has just said. There, there are those issues that you can study in the observational way, uh, like lung cancer and smoking or, um, encephalopathy from uh, trauma, from football. But most of the information that we know about drugs has to come from randomized controlled trials. And our so-called evidence-based medicine is built on a foundation of high quality randomized controlled trials. And then the hierarchy goes up to systematic reviews and then to guidelines. The problem is that when we practice evidence-based medicine, that's what good doctors are supposed to do. Evidence-based medicine has to be based on evidence. 
and the evidence is not available. The, the research tool that you need to get the real evidence is a subpoena. And there's virtually no other way to get it. So th even the doctors who are dutifully reading journals and critically reading the research technique and the research design and the analyses, they are not getting near the evidence. They're like the slaves in Plato's cave where they're looking at the shadows on the wall and thinking they're getting evidence. And we can't practice medicine without evidence. The systematic reviews can't cure that problem because they're built on, um, on the studies that have not been peer reviewed. And the guidelines are written by um, experts, many of whom have conflicts of interest, and many of the organizations that are coordinating the guidelines have conflicts of interest. And the experts who write the guidelines, they too don't have access to the data. In fact, um, this problem is so universal and kept so secret. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable to me that I didn't find out about this until I was well into the process of, of being an expert in litigation. And that we don't know that evidence-based medicine is not based on evidence and that the United States is unique amongst wealthy nations in not having health technology assessment. So we have no outside independent organization like uh, Dr. Harris was talking about before we came on um, where non-conflicted serious uh, experts get together and determine what the evidence really shows. We don't have that. So we don't have, the, the journal articles are not based on evidence. Um, we don't have health technology assessment to inform doctors. And that leaves the field wide open for the pharmaceutical companies to design studies and to analyze studies and to publish studies in ways that serve their financial interests. And they're very clear that that's their job is to make as much money to, to, to um, to return as much money to their investors as is possible without a ceiling. It's not like they need 20% or 30%. They need as much as the executives can squeeze out every year or the executives are gonna find another job. So we have a system where the emperor has no clothes and we can't get the message out that we need evidence to practice medicine.